Hi, I'm James, your virtual trainer, and here are your objectives. What is an oxidation, reduction reaction, also known as a redox reaction? A classic example of an oxidation reduction reaction is rusting. We say this shiny bolt that became rusty over time has been oxidized. But oxidation reduction can be more than just rusting. For example, we may say the inside of this apple becomes oxidized as it is exposed to air. Oxidation reduction reactions occur in lead acid batteries, also in dry cell batteries, and also in bleaching. Oxidation reduction reactions are those chemical changes in which electrons are gained or lost. Oxidation is the loss of electrons. Reduction is the gain of electrons. We say that when something has lost electrons it has been oxidized. And when something has gained electrons it has been reduced. Here are two mnemonic expressions to help you remember the difference between oxidation and reduction. Choose whichever one you like best. In a previous module we talked about the concept of conductivity. Recall conductivity is the ability of a material to allow electron flow. Metals are ranked according to their ability to give up electrons. This information is listed in a table called the electromotive series. The higher the metal is on the chart, the easier it gives up electrons. And, because loss of electrons is called oxidation, the higher the metal is on the chart the easier that metal corrodes or oxidizes. Corrosion is defined as, the deterioration of a material resulting from chemical interaction with its environment. Corrosion is usually the result of an oxidation reduction reaction. General corrosion occurs when the surface of a metal undergoes a slow, relatively uniform deterioration and removal of metal. General corrosion involves a chemical reaction between the metal and its surroundings. It's usually the result of an oxidation reduction reaction. In many cases, this reaction occurs between the metal and either oxygen in the air or some other oxidizing agent, such as a chloride ion. The mechanism by which general corrosion occurs is the metal ionizes, dissolves into solution, and may form other compounds such as metal oxides. For example, the rusting of iron. Iron is exposed to water and air. Here at SRS many of our systems, structures and components are exposed to the elements, making them highly susceptible to rusting. The iron is oxidized, it loses electrons to the hydrogen in the water and air.
ionized hydrogen in the water is reduced, that is, gains electrons. Here is the overall reaction. Now, some iron ions will dissolve and cause the surface to thin out. And some will combine with the oxygen to form iron oxide, also known as rust. We'll now discuss the seven factors that affect the rate of general corrosion. As temperature increases, corrosion rate also increases. This is because, as we learned in a previous module, higher temperatures speed up reactions. The presence of oxygen increases oxidation, and thus, the corrosion rate. Highly acidic or highly basic environments are not good for metals. To ensure a minimal corrosion rate, the pH of the liquid in contact with the metal should be maintained between 4 and 10. Irregular metal surfaces create areas where corrosion can initiate and proceed at a faster than normal rate. Also, Metals listed higher on the activity series will corrode more readily than those listed lower. Finally, some alloys are more corrosion resistant than others. Removal of the protective layer, such as the paint, exposes more metal to corrosion and increases the corrosion rate. Charged particles in the solution promote current flow and increase the rate of reaction and corrosion. So, to prevent general corrosion, we must eliminate the factors that oxidize the metal or accelerate the rate of reaction. One such way is to separate the metal from water in the environment by painting or applying a protective coating, like oil. Passivity is the process of allowing an oxide layer to form between the metal and the environment, slowing the corrosion rate. In other words, you allow the metal to rust under controlled conditions. You only want a thin layer of rust to form. You don't want the metal to rust all the way through. The effectiveness of this process depends on the uniformity of the metal and the ability of the oxide layer to adhere to the metal surface. Now we'll discuss other types of corrosion, starting with galvanic corrosion. Galvanic corrosion occurs when two different types of metals, or, dissimilar metals, with different electrical potentials, or voltage, are placed in contact with one another in an electrolyte. Because there is a difference in potentials, electrons flow from the more active metal, causing the more active metal to corrode faster than the other. To prevent galvanic corrosion from occurring, you should do the following. Use only one metal. Use metals of close oxidation potential. Prevent physical contact between metals. Prevent contact with an electrolyte. The process of galvanic corrosion also has a beneficial application, using sacrificial anodes. A sacrificial anode is a metal that is more easily oxidized than the metal to be protected. It is connected to the metal to be protected and corrodes in place of it. Here is an example of a sacrificial anode, on the left, attached to the water main pipe on the right. The iron water main pipe is exposed to the environment and we don't want it to rust through. 
so every once in a while the sacrificial anode is replaced as it rusts in place of the water main pipe. Pitting corrosion occurs when the corrosion site becomes fixed in a small area. The formation of holes, or pits, takes place in an otherwise unaffected area. The mechanism that causes pitting corrosion is the same as that for general corrosion. The metal ionizes and dissolves into solution. Other compounds may be formed such as metal oxides. The thickness of the metal is reduced locally, but the majority of the surface remains unattacked. Listed here are ways to prevent pitting corrosion. Avoid stagnant conditions, such as places where water settles. Use non-corrosive metals. Avoid ionic impurities, such as chlorine. And, avoid scale buildup and settling out solids. Another type of corrosion is called, crevice corrosion. This is a type of pitting corrosion that occurs, as the name implies, in low flow areas or crevices, where liquid can accumulate. The mechanism that causes crevice corrosion is different oxygen concentrations are in the solution inside the crevice than in the solution outside the crevice. Crevice corrosion may be prevented by the same preventive measures as with pitting corrosion, with the addition of, designing systems to minimize crevices, and using welded instead of riveted joints. Stress corrosion cracking is a type of corrosion that can produce spontaneous failure of metals as the result of the combined action of a corrosive environment and tensile, pulling apart, stress. This type of corrosion occurs at the microscopic level and may or may not be visible to the naked eye. Stress corrosion cracking can occur rapidly and component failure can occur without notice. For stress corrosion cracking to occur, you need to have a susceptible material, a corrosive environment, and tensile stress. NDK Crystal operated a synthetic quartz crystal manufacturing facility in an industrial area adjacent to Interstate 90 in Belvedere, Illinois. NDK produces large crystals used for a variety of products, particularly electronic devices. The facility housed eight massive cylindrical pressure vessels with eight-inch thick steel walls standing 50 feet tall. Inside the vessels, raw mined quartz, or silica, was mixed with a corrosive sodium hydroxide solution at extremely high 150 days to allow the growth of large single crystals of quartz. The silica and sodium hydroxide react with iron in the walls of the steel vessel, forming a layer of sodium iron silicate, or acmite. The company believed this acmite coating would protect the vessels from the corrosive effects of the chemicals inside. Over the years, NDK was warned that corrosion might be compromising the walls of the pressure vessels. Yet the company continued to operate these vessels without performing recommended inspections. On December 7, 2009, 
pressure vessel number two was 120 days into a routine 150-day crystal growing cycle, when suddenly, at about 2.30 p.m., it violently ruptured. Large pieces of structural steel were thrown from the building. One piece was blown 650 feet toward a gas station on the Illinois Tollway. Tragically, the building fragment struck and killed a driver who was walking back to his truck. A large piece of the pressure vessel tore through an exterior wall of the NDK facility, skipped across a neighboring parking lot, and struck the wall of an adjacent automotive supply company where nearly 70 people were working. One was injured. To determine the cause of the failure, the CSB reviewed process data from vessel number two and worked with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, to examine results from metallurgical testing. The investigation concluded that the failure most likely resulted from stress corrosion cracking on the inside walls of the vessel, which had gone uninspected and undetected for years. In fact, the CSB learned that NDK never actually tested or verified the effectiveness of the acmite coating to prevent the corrosion in the vessels. In addition, the CSB found the design of the NDK vessels made them inherently susceptible to stress corrosion cracking. A combination of vessel materials, caustic sodium hydroxide solution, and high temperatures and pressures created a corrosive environment inside the vessels. Also, the vessels did not meet requirements of the widely recognized ASME boiler and pressure vessel code. The thickness of the vessel walls exceeded recommended limits to ensure safe manufacturing, and three of the vessels did not meet the code's requirements for toughness. In 2002, NDK had petitioned Illinois state regulators for a special exemption to use the three vessels, and this was granted. The vessel designer, engineering pressure systems, recommended that the inside of the vessels be inspected annually. But the CSB found that neither NDK nor the state of Illinois ever performed regular internal inspections of any of the eight vessels. In January 2007, pressure vessel number six experienced an uncontrolled leak of hot caustic material through its lid. The leak sprayed onto the ceiling and fifth floor of the NDK facility, but caused no injuries. NDK initiated an investigation into the accident. A third-party consultant, hired by NDK's insurance company, determined that the leak in the vessel lid was caused by stress corrosion cracking and concluded that the vessel's improper design, fabrication, and material selection were the cause. Later, in August of 2007, the insurance company informed NDK in a letter that its consultant had serious reservations about returning the pressure vessels to service and that a decision to do so would be seriously flawed. The insurance consultant specifically cautioned NDK that far more catastrophic scenarios are possible, putting NDK employees and the public at risk, specifically naming the Illinois Tollway Oasis gas station where the truck driver would be killed by flying debris two and a half years later. Despite this strong warning, NDK continued to operate the vessels without establishing an internal inspection program or verifying whether the acmite coating was in fact protecting the vessels from corrosion. And over the years, the state of Illinois only performed inspections of accessible external surfaces and pressure relief devices of the vessels never examining the vessels for corrosion inside. The state had approved the vessels for non-corrosive use without thoroughly examining whether the crystal growing process would corrode the metal walls. Overall, the CSB found that no certified inspector had ever performed internal inspections of vessel number two during the six years it was in service. The CSB also found, despite the inherent hazards of the large-scale, high-pressure process at NDK, it was unsafely sited in a light industrial area near other businesses, the interstate, and the rest area. The city of Belvedere has no additional siting or zoning requirements for heavy industrial facilities or requirements for considering the off-site impact of industrial accidents. In its report, 
the board recommended stricter requirements for the design of heavy-walled pressure vessels to reduce the susceptibility to corrosion or damage in high-pressure operations. The board also recommended that NDK use an inherently safer process for growing synthetic crystals, preferably using lower pressures and temperatures. The board said such a process is already used by another company in Ohio. The CSB urged that Illinois regulators develop procedures to better identify pressure vessels subject to corrosion and require regular internal inspections. And the board recommended that NDK conduct an independent facility siting study prior to restarting operations to address off-site consequences. The CSB concluded that with stricter regulations for the design and construction of high-pressure vessels and regular inspections for corrosion, catastrophic accidents like the one at NDK can be prevented. For more information, please visit csb.gov. Listed here are some ways that stress corrosion cracking can be prevented. Reduce tensile stresses. This may not be possible due to construction of systems and heating and cooling. Use alternate materials, however, this may be costly. Eliminate or reduce severity of the corrosive environment. This may be restricted by the process chemicals used. For chloride stress corrosion cracking, operate at the lowest temperature possible, also, remove all chloride ions and all oxygen from the process. For caustic stress corrosion cracking, maintain a lower pH. Material science involves the study of the structure and properties of metals, stress mechanisms in metals, failure modes, and the characteristics of metals that are commonly used in DOE nuclear facilities. This information will provide personnel with a foundation for understanding the properties of facility materials and the way these properties can impose limitations on the operation of equipment and systems. Now let's talk about material stress. When a load is applied to a metal, the metal reacts by distorting, compressing, warping, or stretching, to counterbalance the force. If the load is large enough, the metal may permanently deform. Recall from physics, the formula for calculating stress, is applied force divided by the cross-sectional area. Also recall from physics, the three types of stress, tensile, or, pulling apart, compressive, or pressed together, and shear, or tearing apart or when two parts of a material slide across each other.
when this bar is bent, there are two types of stresses at work. Tensile at the top, and compressive at the bottom. Listed here are some sources of material stress. One common type of material stress is material expansion and contraction. The amount of expansion and or contraction a material undergoes depends on two things, the amount of temperature change that has occurred, and the type of material. Next we'll talk about thermal stress and thermal shock. These two concepts are very similar and it is very important that you are able to distinguish the two. Thermal stress is caused by uneven heating or cooling of a uniform material, or, even heating or cooling of a non-uniform material. Thermal shock is caused by rapid heating or cooling of material. To reduce the severity of thermal shock, you should use heat up and cool down rate limits for components. Specify temperatures for specific pressures for system operations. Set temperature limits for placing systems in operation. There are two types of material fracture or breakage, they are ductile and brittle fracture. With ductile fracture, metals will deform before fracturing. This deformation is usually concentrated near the fracture faces, and occurs over a period of time. Brittle fracture occurs without the material deforming before fracturing and the crack moves rapidly. If a material has to fail, we'd prefer it to be a result of ductile fracture, rather than brittle. Think about it. Brittle fracture happens so fast, we probably won't have time to respond before the component fails. On the other hand, since with ductile fracture, the material deforms before it breaks or fails, we will have time to respond. So with that in mind, there's a concept called nil ductility transition temperature. We know that most materials are more brittle when they get cold, but may be more ductile when they are heated up. Think of putting a candy bar in the refrigerator and freezing it. When you take it out and try to break it, it will snap. But the same candy bar at room temperature will bend before it breaks. Nil ductility transition temperature is defined as the temperature above which a material is ductile, and below which it is brittle. Fracture toughness is a measure of the amount of stress needed to move an existing flaw. It depends on the type of metal, the temperature of the metal, the size of the deformations in the metal, the metal grain size and the metal crystal type. Three conditions are necessary for brittle fracture to occur, they are A flaw such as a crack a stress applied to the flaw that is large enough to cause a small deformation at the crack tip. And, a temperature low enough to promote brittle fracture, that is, below the nil ductility transition temperature. Three conditions that tend to minimize crack initiation are Using a smaller grain size, higher temperatures, and lower stress on the material. 